You always do some really cool K-SQL demos sometimes, but you ever wonder what people use it for in real life? Well, my guest Nick Dearden is going to tell us on today's episode of Streaming Audio, a podcast about Kafka, Confluent, and the cloud. All right, welcome back, folks. I'm your host, Tim Berglund, and here in the Streaming Audio studios today, I have with me my friend and coworker, Nick Dearden. Hey. Good to be here, Tim. Great to have you here. Now, uh, we talk about all kinds of things on streaming audio. Uh, we have in past episodes talked about KSQL. It is likely in future episodes we will talk about KSQL. Our focus is normally uh, purely technical, right? Like how does it work under the covers? How do you use it? What are new features? Um, and I'd like to talk about, a, take a slightly different angle on it today. But first, Nick, why don't you tell our audience about yourself? What is it that you do at Confluent? Ah, I am the uh, the wearer of many hats, in fact, at Confluent. So I was lucky enough to join the company a couple of years ago as an engineering director. Uh, I've worked on KSQL since it was just a dream on our whiteboard downstairs. And uh, these days, I'm lucky to get to spend more of my time going out, talking to our users of the product, potential users, checking out the kind of projects they're looking at, and helping them understand how they can use these cool new tools we're coming up with. Helps us really close that feedback loop, right? Get feedback from the customers, what their projects are. We help educate them faster. You know, the world revolves faster. That's what we're about here. Yes, yes. And um, that is so important. So uh, on my team, uh, and certainly you've done plenty of this uh, also, we're normally focused on, uh, you know, meetups and conferences and what, what are developers wanting to do next and how do we help them know where they should invest uh, in, in their knowledge portfolio, the next kind of thing they're going to learn. Um, and now you're looking at people who are like, well, how are we actually going to use this in a project and spend money on things, uh, invest real resources in building stuff? So um, it is in a sense past the, okay, it's cool. I want to explore something with it and into the, it's time to build something. And I, I think there's multiple angles to that actually in addition to what you just said so you know my uh previous jobs before i had the you know the luxury of working at confluent i used to run data engineering data science groups right teams of people building microservices and things like this and that's how i discovered the magic of kafka actually in the first instance ah. um and so i can really you know easily put myself in the shoes of folks who are maybe they have some new project or a new business problem ahead of them and they're going through this mental exercise of thinking which of the tools and techniques that are out there, or maybe we have just some toehold or interest in in our group, are the right ones for us to use right now? Right. And I think that's the interesting thing for us, right? As a developer or a technical person, you're always trying to solve a real problem and you're trying to do it with technology. And you need to understand both sides of that coin, right. I think, to make the best choices for you and your organization. So somewhere there's a harmony or an overlap between these two worlds. Yeah, yeah. So... What I want to ask you about today is uh, what are people actually using KSQL for? Um, you know, I I know how to how to talk about how it works and how to show it off and like demo it in a way that is interesting and easy to digest. But what are the actual use cases that are happening out in the world? Let's just take us through a few. Yeah, that's actually been one of the most eye opening things to me recently is just how broad the range of things you can apply this. It's really the culmination of our whole stream processing platform vision in a way. That's really what the, the message is that we put out in the world that a streaming platform is for. Actually, it's a very horizontal kind of technology. You can apply it to many different business verticals. So just off the top of my head, you know, there's obviously a large constituency of people who work in financial services, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in the back end of various banks or card issuers or payment processors all around the world. Uh, and they're looking at things you might immediately identify like fraud, right? Anti-money laundering. Right. These are business problems where it's clear to people that the faster they can reach some algorithmic answer to a question, the more valuable that is to them. You know, it's great knowing I had some fraud yesterday, but if I could <laughs> know I was having some fraud right now, clearly I'd save some more money. Yes. Uh, so yes. those are real easy examples. And that's uh, uh, a common experience to anybody who uses a credit card these days. Um, you, you get those text messages or emails right away, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And many of those text messages actually come through Kafka. 
Yes, as it happens. As it happens. Right, right. right. We won't say which ones. No, we will not. But in fact, um, there are there are credit card fraud notifications that you, uh, our audience, may receive that have been processed through Kafka. Uh, we don't know if UK SQL, but yeah, anyway, give us a list before we dive into them. What are the use cases that you've got in mind? I thought maybe we'd talk about a few different sort of major verticals today. We could talk about fi FinServe, financial mm -hmm. services all day long, but there's lots of people in more traditional businesses like retail or in manufacturing or in you know minerals extraction. Ooh. Uh, there's obviously all the cool kids doing cyber and internet related things. And there's we can describe use cases across that spread of folks. Okay. All right. Let's. I like mineral extraction. That's uh, that's not one I saw coming here when we entered the studio. Talk to me. Well, some of the. So you know, you could probably tell from my accent. I, I know you know Tim. I'm English originally before I, I moved to California. I guys, I did know that. I just want you to know. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, biggest companies listed on the London Stock Exchange are actually mineral extractions folks. Really? Yeah. Okay. Some giant companies, BHP Billitons and companies like that of the world. It's clearly a very, very money capital intensive business. Mm -hmm. They spend a lot of that money on equipment, actually. So probably we've all seen on YouTube or on the TV, those enormous yellow trucks, for example, that are you know right. bigger than my house here in California. Yeah, where the tires are, well, the California house, the tires are bigger than your house. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sadly true. Yeah. Uh, and those things clearly cost many millions of dollars. Right. And both those trucks and the big digging machines and the long conveyors and the whatever you call the yeah, grinding yeah, yeah. machines. Some, some of the, the digging rocks. machines look like fake science fiction things. That, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Capital intensive. I would say so. Mm -hmm. now, all those machines these days are covered in sensors. Of course. It's a bit like uh, you know watching an F1 car in some sense. They're actually applying mm -hmm. these sensors over all of this machinery so they can predictively spot where some outage or a little piece of maintenance is going to be required. Okay. So they can both order up the parts, right? Those tires you're talking about, they can be $100,000 a piece. Mm -hmm. You don't want to keep too many in stock if you don't need them. Yes. And you also really don't want to wait until the truck breaks down at the bottom of a big open cast pit right. before right. you need to get down there because and change it. In fact, not in inventory at discount tire uh, down the block. Uh, there could be some lead time. No, and you know, generally these mines uh, are not conducive to being around the corner from the discount from tire place right, right right in the middle of the desert or up a mountain or someplace yeah okay okay that makes sense um, so they 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 want to minimize inventory but but also have some and mm -hmm. and know you know six weeks from now we see this trend in the data that means in six weeks this is going to happen or you know tomorrow this is going to happen or whatever I mean, all the cool kids are doing machine learning on signals these of days course. aren't they and this kind of machinery is perfect for that yeah it's just correlate another, the weather outside and the dust in the atmosphere from some sensor with the some sensor on the carburetor it's of the giant truck and just you know another vector stop. yeah okay and you can ml that just like anything else that's right okay all right and if we extend to other extractive industries for example if you're mining for oil and gas beneath the ocean mm -hmm. right your output comes back through a pipeline same way that the actually the water to my house comes through a pipeline these pipes have valves and pumping stations and that's also indicative of equipment that is increasingly being instrumented. Right, right. Um, and uh, it's funny, pipeline instrumentation uh, by itself isn't new. That was, uh, as I'm recalling, my my first software job in college actually was a satellite communications startup. And their first customer was uh, a SCADA network, which is the, you know, the mm -hmm. billion years ago way that was done. Uh, and so now, of course, you're going to see more sensors they're going to be cheaper they're going to be everywhere and is it the same kind of predictive analytics kind of thinking or is there more i think these days we're looking at more closed loop things right so uh, in the case of a pipeline it might be that you can send control signals back which will turn off a valve or open a relief valve something of that nature right where previously you might have had to buy very very expensive and tailored software packages you know i don't know if you were to go to uh try and download the software to run an oil refinery Right, it's probably not open source on GitHub. No, probably not. Uh, it's probably super customized and tailored. But the more mm -hmm. we can empower people to take those kind of control loops and make their own, right, and uh, turn off the valve when maybe something is about to go wrong. Mm -hmm. You don't want and and here's here's the you know the the Confluent platform angle or the Kafka angle is uh, you don't want a job that ran last night to tell you that you should do that tomorrow. To do that in a way that you don't say leak oil anywhere, you have to be turning it off at times when you wouldn't have to. There, you have to build in, if it's batch, you have to build in kind of a conservatism to the algorithm. Mm -hmm. 
and you'd shut down at times when you're not going to leak. But if you're real time, then of course you can say, well, it's probably going to do this in the next say 15 minutes. Let's, let's shut it off. That's uh, right. And so you're, you're going to be able to maximize throughput by virtue of having a real time system behind yeah. things. And you know, from a technologist's point of view, that kind of algorithm is very similar to the fraud detection we talked about before. Yeah, it is. There are what I would call white cases and black cases, you know, fraud and do I need to open the valve? They're all questions with a spectrum of right answers, actually. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's clear the valve should stay open or that right. the credit card transaction is a good one. Right. Sometimes it's clear that it's a bad one. Right. right. It's clearly fraudulent. I cannot be in 17 cities simultaneously using my credit card. Right. Or, you know, the pressure is way out of bounds. We should close the valve. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes there's the gray zone. Right. And what we increasingly see is people getting interested in those mm -hmm. where you talked about the text messages before. Sometimes you need to route this transaction or this decision about the valve to a human operator. You might have a case management system, right? Where right. there's a little bit of human adjudication is still required. Yeah. You know, machine it's learning so still doesn't solve kind every of in, problem out there. Kind of in the, huh, this is weird category, yes. not in the it's fine or the we're all going to die yeah. extremes. Yeah, the interesting in between. That's right. And giving the machines the ability to ask for help this way from a human operator is really opening up a new class of problems. Yeah. Okay. And that, that interesting in between is going to be probably the category of decisions where making them at low latency, even if that's minutes, right. You know, of, of getting data and a human thinking about it and, you know, flipping the big giant knife switch or not, whatever, whatever that is, um, that still needs to be supported by an event driven system. This is not a thing that you do in batch mode. That's at right. That, at that point. You know, when I go out and talk to these customers, it's a, um, it's almost like training the machine learning model. You train your organization. So over time, you identify, you know, the machine says, this is a pattern of behavior. I need some help. Right. Please have a human adjudicate it. But what we do is we identify patterns, maybe as human operators, right, in those calls for help over time. Mm -hmm. And we can codify new rules for the systems so that less of those types of events are raised to the operators in future right. and are dealt with by the machinery. Right. Okay. And KSQL in this case is the computational engine uh, that's that's encoding those models. The, this is the really cool thing about KSQL is it's opened up in the eyes of many technologists that I talk to the idea that, hey, this is something I can do. Mm. I, I think perhaps there's sometimes a perception that all the cool kids work at Google or Facebook or somewhere and they do all their machine learning mm -hmm. and the rest of us are still working on the systems we were working on 10 years ago. Sure. Um, and something like stream processing can seem quite esoteric. It is, and it is new, right? Like not many yeah. people have done this yet. Well, that's why we talk about this stuff, right? Yeah. There's so many interesting things that happen when you try and join two continuous streams together. Well, what does that even mean? Right. Right. So, um, but the idea that I can at least have a tool that I understand, it's familiar and approachable, that's going to help me do those really complex things is a great intro for folks. Okay. And you think the accessibility, uh, I'm putting words in your mouth, tell me if they're the wrong words. Um, KSQL has an accessibility. Uh, people think, oh, wait, I can do that um, because of its simplicity. It looks like a language that, you know, kind of everybody has known since college and that's right. It's I, I think approachable is the word I would use. Yeah. It's gonna there's still some hard things that you have to learn as you get deeper yeah, into there's, it, some there's obscure corner cases that weird will things. come sure. out. Uh and at the end of the day, we I think we often talk about this when we're talking tech here, is K SQL is built using the Kafka Streams library. Right. Which is, you know, something that plenty of other organizations out there are already using. But they have felt that for some business need, they needed to take that step almost into the unknown mm -hmm. and try something really avant-garde. Which is which is Kafka Streams. It's it's right. the thing that kind of scares people. I, I think so, for some people anyway. Yeah. If you don't have, if it's not your full-time job every day right. to learn this stuff, you know, there's many other things we all need to pay attention to mm -hmm. in the world. Um, if we can minimize that learning curve for you, that's awesome. Yeah, and KSQL does that. Yeah. Which is not, I don't want anybody to hear this who doesn't know Kafka Streams and think, oh no, that's way too hard. Tim and Nick think it's impossible. I mean, it's not. It's a Java API, but I mean, it's an API. I'm explicitly going to be writing code and it's a functional API. And even, uh, you know, at the time of this recording, some of those concepts are still uh, harder for a lot of developers. Right. Functional programming is is establishing uh, key point, key place in the world, but it's still a little weird. And on top of stream processing and things like joining a stream to a stream, 
all that being a little bit strange, uh, the barrier to entry is a little higher. And right, there are yeah. people who are doing it, but case equal that barrier is There, there are just so many more blog posts and docs pages and examples that you need to consume. Right. I, I think that's Java docs. Who needs them? What's right. not? Well, that's I mean, what we have IDEs for, isn't it? <laughs> Exactly. Although my, the challenge I think we have is that although functional programming is cool, it's harder for the ID to help you, isn't it? Yes, it absolutely is. Ironically. Yes. yes. Um, yeah, that's a whole another thing. Yeah. Um, okay, so so uh, resource extraction, I think you'd mentioned retail. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about retail. What, what one might, what might one do with KSQL in retail? Oh, retail. So we see some very big retailers doing things like Real-time inventory tracking. So inventory, I suspect you know, is one of the biggest costs in, in retail. Right. The more inventory you have to hold, you have to account for spoilage, shrinkage, it, 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 storage. It goes away. It costs money to buy it in you the first place. You have to put it somewhere. There's yeah. capital. Everything's terrible. Yeah. Right. So the more you can optimize not only that side of inventory, but also the logistical side. So if you know, I don't know, how many packages of bananas there are on the shelf in this store, mm -hmm how many there are in the back room of that store and how many in some warehouse. Right. Right. You want just in time delivery of bananas to the store. Right. But you also want to plan the route the truck will take ah. between several stores okay. to optimize the cost that you have there. Mm -hmm. And then also sort of back calculating from that, the number of bananas that need to be turning up at the central warehouse. Gotcha. To keep it fed to mm. be able to, right. Right. And so by linking the point of sale systems, uh, back, Right through Kafka and the streaming platform, and aggregating these things, you can not only do the things you would traditionally do in like sort of a you know a batch analytics mode, like how many bananas do we sell on a Wednesday lunchtime, mm -hmm. but also how many are there right now? Right, and to know that you need to have an event-driven point of sale network, which I'm going to guess is probably not. Uh, all that unusual these days. Anybody who has mm -hmm. done an upgrade or, or built that out anytime recently, it's you know things are fairly well connected. It's not hard to I'm not talk about large amounts of data. Um, well, uh, I was disrespectful to large retail chains. Yes, of course there are gigantic amounts of data, but um, everybody's big data is a different size. Is a different it? size exactly. Yeah. So it's gigantic data, but um, the uh, you know the point of sale in the store needs to get that stuff somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, and with those events in a Kafka topic, uh, then we've got the ability to do computations over them mm -hmm. and aggregate and, and the, that's the right. things you said. Yeah. So another thing that's happening with those point of sale systems actually is the inclusion of real time offers. So we're probably familiar in the e-commerce realm with the idea that, you know, the recommendations you see on the side of the page may these days be tailored in real time to what I'm doing or what I'm interested in, mm -hmm. what. It's already in my cart or what I've taken out of the cart and so on. 100%. But now we can do the same kind of things at the point of sale in a physical store. Okay. Right? Because the really advanced folks know what you've just scanned right across the checkout. Uh-huh. Okay. And they know, oh, maybe we'll give you a coupon right now based on what we just learned there and what we know from your store loyalty card about your profile. Okay. Maybe we can you know, encourage you to come back this afternoon and buy some more soft drinks or whatever it might be. Okay, because the sort of person you are and the fact that you just bought, uh, you know, six packages of hamburger buns um, and, and some, some paper plates. Some and, paper yeah. plates yeah. Uh, will give you an incentive to get the chips and guacamole that you probably forgot. That's right. I, if I then, you know, join in the stream of local weather conditions or something, oh, it's a perfect afternoon for barbecue. Right. What does Tim need to buy right now? Yes, yeah. yes. And uh, promotion on apron and big puffy hat. Uh, so you can do it right. You will look fantastic. Exactly. I oh, love it. Uh, okay. Yeah. And, and that, again, that makes sense. That is a decision. That's a computational result that's valuable now and not worthless tomorrow, but probably worth a heck of a lot less tomorrow. That's right. Yeah. And in some cases, uh, it, it is worthless tomorrow, but uh, vastly more valuable to be able to have that result now. Yeah. Well, when we... Oftentimes when we approach people right, and talk about this technology, we can get the engineers excited. And then we'll come and say, Nick, this is amazing stuff. I really want to use it. How do you recommend we start? Mm. And, and the answer is always something along the lines of, you want to think about the problems you know, your business generally faces, but ask yourself, what would be radically different right, if we could take this thing that we currently do in a batch fashion mm -hmm. and we could do it instantly? So 
how would my business fundamentally change if I could know right now that the pipeline is going to explode rather than knowing tomorrow that it did explode? Right. Right. Okay? Everybody's life would be better, wouldn't uh-huh. it? Uh-huh. In the case maybe of coupon codes, it's less dramatically different. But in the aggregate, those things add up to an awful lot of money for people. Yes. Okay. And I like the way you frame that. How would my business be different if I could know this now versus tomorrow? Yeah. Uh, and then that gives you an idea of why it's valuable to make this technology adoption decision. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. If if your answer is going to be, well, I can get a report a little bit faster, uh-huh. that's probably not the most compelling use case to right. start with. Right. Where you can actually impact some business process and accelerate its actual operation. Right. Or gain a tangible competitive advantage yeah. by being able to respond now and make that offer now uh, and not risk um, them, you know, getting a apron that Williams Sonoma or something. I don't know. I'm just, I don't even know if they sell aprons. I'm just making that up. You don't want that to happen. You want that, you know, keep that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. And in, in the extreme cases, I know there's a, um, a use case that we've at least had some excitement talking about in the office recently where uh, I'm thinking of the, the brain pressure monitoring equipment. Yes. Uh, yes. Which uh, there's a unnamed hospital that is uh, aggregating intracranial pressure monitors i think from it's from the NICU. children's hospital yeah, I think. yeah yeah it is it is so it's it's uh pediatric patients and intracranial pressure monitors so that's there's a traumatic brain injury uh the swelling of the brain causes pressure and that's like one of the things that that leads to the bad outcomes is damage from the swelling and so monitoring that is super i'm talking like a doctor here it's you know get all your medical advice from me folks you'll be fine please don't but uh, you know that's that's one thing uh that that can cause long-term bad effects and so if you if you if you know that there's a pressure problem you can react so this was a thing where you know that was being aggregated and monitored centrally right absolutely yeah that's that a super exciting application of k-sql yes and actual k-sql being used to yeah. do computation over that actually stuff. impacting people's health outcomes and sometimes yeah, in the most extreme sense of that mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Of, of truly long-term you know uh disabling injuries or a story or of worse. yeah wow that was close um yeah or worse you're right mm-hmm. uh, and that's another good case of everybody's big data being a different size because you know there are going to only be so many of those monitors um but Hey, this is worth digging into a little bit because that's, I'm just going to say something. That's not a big data problem. Okay. Doesn't that depend on the resolution of your sensors? Ah, uh, maybe it does, but let's, and I don't know. Okay. I don't, I challenge accepted. Okay. Let's talk this one out. Let's do it. I don't actually know what the resolution of those sensors is. No idea. I'm going to guess that like a reading per second is pretty good. Uh, and if you, if you, if you know, so set me straight, that's totally cool. But let me just flap my lips for a second here. Um, I'm going to guess the resolution is not all that high, um, that it's a pressure reading. So the, the, the number of bytes you acquire per reading is not all that great. And you don't acquire that many readings and you only got so many babies in one place. I mean, ca- hospitals are massive accumulations of capital and lots of things, but come on, what are we going to have in a giant city? 10 at once? I don't know. A uh, hundred, even then it's, it's just not a big data problem. Now, maybe so let me let me finish that thought and maybe you can just come back around and flank mm-hmm. me and say, well, it actually is a big data problem. You're dumb. But um, what I was going to say is I'm not convinced that it needs to be one. Like That's right. You don't need to be a web scale concern. You don't need to be Netflix you just to, to get some value out of being able don't. to do this. What yeah. you need is a platform that processes events and does it real good. Mm-hmm. And if you don't have very many events, well, that's okay. Then your infrastructure costs are going to be lower, but you still need a system that is in the habit of solving problems. Like how do I, how do I do aggregations and enrichments and filtering of things that are happening right now? Yes. And how do I store those? And how do I reason about the history and, and all that stuff? That's, that's right. just like native for Kafka and KSQL. And you, you know that in the extreme case, if you, 10x the resolution of the equipment with its next generation or something and right. have a become an enormous hospital chain you know mm-hmm. you've, you're still safe with the same solution right yeah if you want to aggregate it you know federate it all internationally or something well then you can scale out mm-hmm. to that global scale but even if it's not and i think this is encouraging uh for architects thinking about technologies like this 
even if your problem is not some gigantic thing where you get to deploy 200 x32 large instances and feel super cool and brag at parties it really is fine i, I think the fact that you're saving babies lives is much cooler than that that's actually really cool and scale isn't the thing that matters that yeah. just means your operational life is going to be simpler the economic case for kafka for ksql for the confluent platform uh, it it is valid across i think you know several orders of magnitude of mm -hmm. scale i sure the, it is on the vert the horizontal axis there hmm. interesting yeah and so uh one other big category i wanted to bring Please. up um so and again the thing that's striking to me is when we started this project we sort of sat around in a room imagining where we would use these technologies is we thought, well, you know, it's it's for the digital natives, right? That's where all these technologies are born. Kafka famously originated at LinkedIn, where they have sure. a lot of data moving around. Yeah, good. So it's LinkedIn, we, Netflix. Yeah, all yeah. these guys, some mm -hmm. other, you know, folks we shouldn't talk about. Certainly, but um, uh, even just but hypothetically, the big things. What's right? super interesting to me about all the examples I gave you after after at least financial services is they're very real world, physical businesses. Right. Right. You know, real physical babies, real physical pipelines. Yeah. Very 20th, mining rigs, 20th century yeah, kinds of things. Manufacturing lines. And then um, anyone who hasn't yet watched the uh, Audi gentleman's keynote from the Kafka Summit we had in London, I highly encourage you to take so a look at that. So you would Google Audi Kafka Summit London 2018. That'll get you there. Yeah. Yeah. So he's talking about how the future for car companies is not just as a purveyor of a piece of metal. Right. It's actually as a data service. Uh -huh. And so they're very excited about the idea of what they call connected car, right? Which is not only does a car have thousands of sensors within itself, which are all communicating all the time, some of that data is going to be aggregated from the car, streamed back over a cell phone network to some central stations, and then aggregated in totality. And there's some very cool things that are not just about predictive maintenance or you know, marketing opportunities, but about uh, swarm intelligence. So for example, one sort of way out idea that I think the gentleman was discussing is if the ABS sensors all give a certain type of reading and the car temperature sensors within a certain very localized geography, maybe we can figure out at the data center level, there might be some black ice in that area right now. Uh -huh. And we could, you know, flash a warning on everybody's heads up display. Yeah. Hey, careful. black ice, slow down. Or we right. can adjust the frequency at which the ABS operates or something. Yeah. Right. So that idea that a car is just a sensor is, is actually pretty mind blowing. Yeah. And that's changing an industry that's been the same since Henry Ford, essentially. Right. Uh, and his Model T. Yeah. Uh, which is, which is uh, a little bit more interesting than. It's Friday afternoon, and I see you're driving by the liquor store. Here's a little coupon, you know. <laughs> yeah, hopefully we don't all end up in that world. <laughs> right, right, right. That's, uh, um, you know, I, I think some of us probably will, actually. But um, uh, that's a much more compelling kind of set of use cases there, which, again, that is very much a big data problem. Cars are mm -hmm. very much a volume concern. And if you listen to that keynote and you look at the volumes of data that that the deal it was with. astonishing. It, it was. Yeah. yeah, that that was kind of the mind blowing. Wow, I didn't know you could do that with computers kind of thing. And um, still, KSQL has a place in that scale as well. Absolutely, it does. Yeah. Hmm. It's very easy to codify um, a rule, for example, uh, not literal SQL, but I will, I will sort of air quote it for you here, which is select average temperature, comma, breaking distance group by geography. Right. Right. If it's below a certain threshold, then trigger this rule about, hey, black ice warning. Right. There's your there's yep. your case equals pseudo the, code right there. All of us could code that this afternoon. We in fact could. And have it operate on that immense data stream in a very clever way. Right. Without going too far up that learning curve that we talked about. Right. Right. Awesome. Um so uh give you the last word. Any any concluding thoughts on this whole uh, affair and your experience in, in seeing people apply KSQL in interesting ways? I think we've probably outlined a, you know, a range of different businesses and ca the kinds of problems. If I just take it down one notch on the technology scale, right? That's more our kind of normal zone. Right. Is we can change most of these business problems into the same handful of technical patterns where it's, we might call it anomaly detection. 
which is looking for something out of the ordinary in a stream of events. That's what fraud is. That's what cyber intrusion detection is. That's what data center and equipment monitoring is. Right, that's an anomaly detection kind of a pattern. Right, and there are very similar SQL patterns, just with different column names, frankly, that you apply to each of these business domains. Then there's the ones that uh, maybe where you're going to plug in some machine learning or some codified rules, which are basically the offer presentation kind of problems that you might have. Mm -hmm. And then there's the error and exception handling, okay. where 95% of the stream of data is actually boring and not interesting to you. And you want to find the needle that indicates something needs to be responded to. Gotcha. Something that that uh, that says uh, the haystack may be amiss. Right. Yeah. All right. And for more on that, shameless plug here, uh, you could check out confluent.io slash ksql. Uh, that'll get you to a few introductory videos. Uh, that'll get you linked to a cookbook of recipes covering the sorts of cases you've been talking about, an ever-growing cookbook of, of more things. So it's confluent.io slash ksql. Check that out. You can get at the kinds of stuff Nick is talking about. Yep. And uh, oh, Thanks very much, Tim. It's, yes. been, it's been a lot of fun talking this through today. My guest today has been Nick Dearden. Nick, thanks for being a part of Streaming Audio. Thanks for having me. And there you have it. I hope that was helpful to you. If you've got questions, you can ask me at at TL Berglund on Twitter. That's T-L-B-E-R-G-L-U-N-D. Or you can leave a comment on any of our YouTube videos. Your question might be featured on the next episode of Streaming Audio. And feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel and this podcast wherever fine podcasts are sold. And if you subscribe through iTunes, be sure to leave us a review there. That helps other people discover the podcast and just generally helps us get the word out. We appreciate your support. See you next time.